We have an amazing panel with us today. You're going to get to meet them shortly. And uh, we're going to move along with this activity and I'm going to welcome at this point our Vice Principal, Dr. Mel Sinclair Ogis, to share some words with us, to make a few brief remarks. Thank you, Ms. Saju Singh. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, these are going to be very brief remarks. But let me first thank um, the committee members of the academic discourse for uh, organizing the engagement of the minds of this event. It is always refreshing. And it is with pleasure I offer these brief words, which I hope will provide some context to this discourse. Last year's discourse with the theme, I hope some of you remember, the role of the academic as a force of social change in society. Well, for me and for others, I think it provided opportunity for rich discussion. And I have no doubt that this year's will do the same. With the success of, success of last year, we continue into this decade with another revolutionary theme, as mentioned by Mrs. Ms. Saju Singh. And it sits well with me. I like it. Um, artistic revolution from reading has been interpreted as, quote, abrupt changes from one art movement to another. So I'm asking, as a society, have we had that movement with our art? Are we currently engaged in one? Is there now a post-Walcott movement? Is the legacy of the great Vincent Joseph Udovic now re-emerging through his son? How is technology weighing in or featuring in this? Since art influences in a myriad of ways, from changing opinions to implanting values to interpreting experiences throughout history, we know that it is a powerful tool of communication. And more significantly, it is vital to our being. As we connect through art, through what is essentially the repository of a society's memory, we are also invited to appreciate each other through our cultures and various time periods, through images, stories, and sound. We can accept the forceful perspective that art can be a conduit for social change manifesting time and time again, as we have all seen, as we are moved by a song or an image which can evoke pleasure, tears, anger, disdain, resolve, inspire resilience or promote action, or for some, it does nothing. I hope we can explore this discourse, the artistic revolution that's happening in our St. Lucian society today. I look forward to the revolutionary perspectives that would be shared by our panelists and hope that the audience is inspired by this discussion as well. So, let us commence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sinclair Ogis. And um, we'll start with some introductions. Firstly, of myself, your MC, Nicole Sager Singh. I'm a Spanish lecturer at the South Louis Community College. And um, I'm going to motion to our moderator for this event. He will just indicate Mr. Ernest Otley, also a lecturer of the South Lewis Community College. He lectures psychology and management. And uh, Mr. Otley has quite a few accolades under his belt as well. I can tell that he's blushing on the inside and the outside too. Um, he's quite into music, very involved with the arts. Music, he's a songwriter, producer, former chairperson of the National Junior Calypso Committee. He's been involved in a number of um, productions, He's the co-founder also of Risen FM radio station. And there's quite a few that we can add to the bio of Mr. Ernest Otley here. So he will be our esteemed moderator for this panel discussion. And now an introduction of our very heterogeneous core of academics, of intellectuals, of professionals, of very talented St. Lucians, who we are very, very happy to have with us today. And uh, we'll start introducing them in the order in which they will present as well. So we have our very own Miss Crescentiana Charles, who is a lecturer, she's giving us the little uh, Meghan Markle wave there, <laughs> a lecturer of architecture at the South Luski. Yes, feel free to give a round of applause, one of our own. Lecture of Architecture at the South Lewis Community College. She has 10 years 
um, lecturing experience in the building departments of the college. She presently holds the position of program coordinator of the architectural technology program, holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in architecture from the University of Santiago de Cuba. And we move on to one of our very own as well, Mr. Kennedy Boots Samuel, some familiar faces, St. Lucian educator, theater artist, cultural manager, cultural activist, as you would be aware, currently serves as a lecturer here in communication studies and theater arts. Um, he's the holder of two master's degrees in education and arts administration, holds two postgraduate diplomas in language education, cultural management, we also know and would be familiar with the fact that he has served as the executive director of two principal cultural institutions on Ireland, the Cultural Development Foundation and the Monsignor Patrick Anthony Folk Research Center. He's a very experienced theatrical practitioner and um, he has been the recipient of several MNC Fine Arts Awards. Thank you so much, Mr. Kennedy Boot Samuel for joining us. Another one of our very own, we have Mr. Ted Sandiford, who is a visual arts professional. He is the founder of Acid Creations. You may be familiar with his work. Um, he's a media arts and an uh, Acid Creations is a media arts and animation company geared at providing services such as 2D and 3D animation, graphic designs, caricatures, uh, digital portraits, photo editing, acrylic painting. Ted Sandiford is currently a lecturer and program coordinator for digital media at the South Lewis Community College. A round of applause, please. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Ted Sandiford. A staunch theater activist, Ms. Drina Frederick, one of our other lovely panelists, is a graduate from the University of the West Indies Mona Campus, Jamaica, and the Edna Manley School of Performing Arts. She's a director of stage and film. She's a playwright and an actor and has in been involved in the arts in St. Lucia for, I wonder if you could guess, right. that's, <laughs> that's right, 30 years, yes, over 30 years, and has directed several major productions, some that you might be familiar with or should be familiar with, and these include Papi Show, Papi Show Park, Desiree, Revelations, Jesus of Conway, Sarafina, Anthem, and Tindy. Uh, Drina Frederick is currently the Director of Events and Production at the Cultural Development Foundation. Thank you, Ms. Frederick. And our final panelist, we have Mr. Jalim Udovic. Mr. Jalim Udovic will give us a little wave there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and he's well known for his minimalistic and conceptual wooden block sculptures. His highly skilled craftsmanship shows exceptional and one-of-a-kind talent. I'm sure we'll agree. Um, his sculptures are layered with creative force, Caribbean wit, spirituality, and poetry, all-encompassing work. Mr. Yudovic's large-scale uh, bronze sculptures are just as impressive as his wooden sculptures. The St. Lucian-born artist has presented his work at several public art commissions in China. Jalim also has his work showcased in various private collections in the Caribbean, the United States, Europe, all around the world. And his work is heavily influenced by various cultures, primarily African culture. As he says, and I quote, African contemporary or African traditional art, also Western contemporary art are his biggest influences. Okay, thank you very much. You have your panelists. I am going to <laughs> hand you over to our esteemed moderator, Mr. Otley. Thank you so very much, Mrs. Sajjah Singh. Today, art is in focus. It is interestingly paired with the word revolution. We have an equally interesting assemblage of panelists an architect, two dramatists, a digital media specialist, and a sculptor. They will explore the topic today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Academic Discourse 2020, Artistic Revolution. We present to you our architect, Crescentiana Charles. Um, 
Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, students. I would like to acknowledge, first and foremost, the um, protocol established here this afternoon. The word architect or architecture has many meanings and definitions from several different sources. But I prefer using the art and practice of designing and making buildings with great emphasis on the physical and environmental sciences. As this explanation best highlights the importance of all major disciplines associated with architecture. In my humble opinion, architecture is the mother of all arts. Sorry, I'm a bit biased. It is timeless. It's timeless as we are trying to discover its many mysteries. An example is the Great Pyramids of Giza in Egypt, constructed in approximately 1301 BC with 2 million one ton stone blocks reaching a height of 1.46 meters. Its scale, stretching its limitations, stretching the limitations of construction by having skyscrapers done. An example is the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France. Completed in 1889, an archi the architect and engineer, Gustave Eiffel. The towering height of the structure, 324 meters, all of, uh, all of iron, and gaining the title of the tallest building in the world during the World Fair in 1889. It is evolutionary. Designing with its environmental conditions, pushing the boundaries of construction technologies, building materials, and location. A good example is the Bahurf Caliph in Dubai, United Emirates, standing at a towering height of 229 meters and gaining the title of tallest building in the world present to date. To understand our architectural heritage in St. Lucia, let us take a quick trip through our historical background. Our true ancestors, who should have shaped our architectural legacy or influence, should have been the Caribs and Arawaks, the first settlers of the Caribbean. Their building materials of choice, simple timbers and thatched materials kept the elements, sun, rain, out of their structures. The engineering construction methods, elevated structures or on the ground structures, were an artistic revolution in its own right. Little evidence of the architectural prowess is known as several of little, sorry, survived that particular period of their existence. Moving forward towards the end of the 1400s. As a result of circumstances that brought about colonialism and slavery during the, 90, during the 1500s and throughout the mid-1800s, approximately 300 years of architectural heritage reigned over and dramatically changed the landscape of the Caribbean or even, we could say, the Americas. The architectural dominant style came and stemmed from the Renaissance period, the Rococo, the Baroque period. These buildings dotted the landscape of countries such as Cuba, Jamaica, Martinique, and Barbados, Martinique um, in the Caribbean region, Mexico through to Panama in Central America, and all the countries on the South American continent. These manifested mainly in large churches, cathedrals, plantation, and estate homes. Many of these buildings were copied from Europe. However, they were repli However, they were they evolved um, through scientific basis, having them adapt to its environment, having also its elements of and functional spaces suit the environment within the Caribbean space. Some significant adaptations that were used. One of them were the roof, steep, steep pitch roofs to ensure the evacuation of rain waters and also for its collection and of course to withstand hurricane conditions. The fenestration, we're talking about doors and windows. 
the use of glass and the inclusion of vented spaces or elements to allow for the maximum influx of light and wind while providing complete privacy to the interior of the space. Amazingly, these structures mentioned, for instance, the steep roof system was adopted from the simple structures used through its indigenous settlers, the Arawaks and Caribs. Our African ancestors were most instrumental in the construction of these buildings. Contrary to popular belief at the time, the African people were a skilled and very learned race. As fretwork and gingerbread details adorned and established, and sorry, were adorned and embellished the plantation houses with their contributions to the colonial architectural style. During the period post-1939 to St. Lucian's independence in 1979, Almost 140 years, the architectural landscape of St. Lucia was dominated and dictated by her colonial country. The importation of its civic, military, and residential buildings and the development of the urban landscape is to date St. Lucia's legacy, architectural legacy. Therefore, technically one can conclude St. Lucia does not have her own architectural style. This is evident in well-known buildings that exist to date, in the Civic Building, the Castries Market, the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception in Castries, the Military Building, St. Mary's College site at Vigi, and of course our very own South Lewis Community College, Mourn Fortune. The Residential Building, the, government, the Governor General Residence, Mourn Fortune. Moreover, Persons seeking their own homes during that 140-year period used the floor layouts of the large plantation homes on a very reduced scale to adapt and construct their dwellings. The construction of the typical residential dwelling is what is now indigenous to St. Lucia. There are two notable types. The beautiful three-story buildings which lined Brazil Street in the 1970s and 80s, the one that comes to mind very clearly is the Rain Restaurant, were part of the upper-class residential landscape. The single-story buildings along Riverside Road and Chaussee Road were part of the middle-class residential landscape. One that comes to mind very clearly is the Walcott Building. The architectural landscape of post-independence period shifted its eye and its vision to North America in its movement towards modernism. Simply put, we adopted the rectangular reinforced metal glass box, which created a new urban fabric and landscape of St. Lucia. Multi-story buildings are being built, each with its own microclimate, creating now a new environment for the use and the exploit of significant energy consumption. Sadly, the majority of these buildings after a few years become now breeding grounds and they are now considered to be sick buildings. Ensuring our architecture remains and becomes sustainable is an elusive concept and has diverse definitions. In a straightforward way, it means the current development should not harm the interests of the future generations. We must consider development through one, urban transformation, and two, sustainable architecture. As the two is interconnected, under sustainable urban transformation, it will deal with location and environment, and sustainable architecture encompasses the constructed or the construction of new buildings. Both elements are the framework and are particularly important for the future development and the changes that will occur within the physical, economic, social, environmental aspects impacting architecture and urban development. Our architectural landscape can be revitalized through ambitious endeavors, but must be economical. 
realistic, and balanced. The economic transformation often provides opportunities through technolo technological advancements, one of which is in the use of green and recyclable materials in the, in the construction industry. Further, it must have the ability to be flexible for the rapid changes occurring in the urban condition. We must understand human behavior, the incorporation and vitalization of green and blue spaces. Green spaces, we're talking about parks and gardens, and blue spaces, water elements, and the re-energizing of our rivers. Revitalizing the functional methods of older homes can be used for creating and realizing enormous potential energy savings within our architectural landscape. Revitalizing urban and architectural fabrics begin to open opportunities for the development of public and social inclusion. Sustainable urban and architectural transformation is more than creating a technical sustainable urban area stimulating econ economic development, and frankly, just developing policies that look good on paper. It must engage, attract, and excite people about the new opportunities of life today and into the future, in order for the population to work seriously to understand and implement a new way of thinking as it relates to climate change and climate preservation. Thank you. Miss Crescentiana Charles, a child of the alleged mother of art, not sure what Mr. Kennedy Boots Samuel will have to say about that, but we take great pleasure in introducing him at this point in time. Mr. Kennedy Boots Samuel. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Greetings, family. Family of our Creole community. Family of the arts. Um, I was told to come and participate in a discussion <laughs> on artistic revolution. And boy, my mind was just spinning as to, I mean, it's a panel discussion, so I just need to make a few little remarks that will open up discussion and so on. Uh, what do I do as an artist, etc.? cetera? Um, let me start by saying revolution, this word revolution and change, it is natural to life, eh? It is natural to life and culture, the way of life of a people. It is natural. However, very interestingly, it is natural to art. Art is revolution. I'm privileged to sit at a table there with a number of revolutionaries, really. Revolutionaries who create. They create, they produce new things that add to a current reality and change reality. This is the nature of art. This is revolution and change. 
revolution is natural to art. And so the artist is naturally a revolutionary in his creation, in his work, his production. He shapes our community. He or she shapes our community, changes our community, develops our community, takes us places we don't even anticipate because they are on the horizon of our reality. And from that, the imagination soars and they create and they bring the imagination into some physical form that changes our world, our reality, our society as we know it. They bring it out in what we call art. So art is about change. Artistic revolution, I don't know if this meant to say that we have an art revolution starting or how can we start an art revolution in St. Lucia. However, because of what I said at first, you would realize that revolution is always happening. In St. Lucia, artistic revolution, that is always happening. It happens all the time. If we are really honest, in our research and our investigation of our lives and so it is at the heart of our development as a people is art and culture is the story of our art and culture I've been around for quite a while yes from the late 50s I was born in late 50s so I went through the 60s and there are some significant things I can just pull out and to show that the art and the revolution has always been happening in St. Lucia. Um, uh, when I began to understand things in the 60s, especially things arts related, you know, I knew about the Arts Guild. The Arts Guild and artists who were going against the grain at the time in the heart of colonial domination and so on <laughs> were creating things as St. Lucians, putting out things, regular theater productions, going to carnival, development of carnival, development of the steel band with the Royal Cut Brothers on Chusey Road and so on. Producing, and Arts Guild is right now iconic, iconic in St. Lucian, in the, in the St. Lucian story, in the St. Lucian cultural story. In the 70s, black power swept the region, black power swept so coming from America, to train that, swept the region, and out of it, this tremendous interest in understanding ourselves, for not how they had taught us, but now better to know, know ourselves. And the artists were at the heart of this, uh, of this change and this revolution and so on. Of course, we know the coming of Rastafarianism, um, Rastafari and everything associated with it, artistic, let's talk the arts, culinary arts, vegetarianism and so on coming from them. The reggae music, reggae music always at the heart of struggle and revolution, a particular music dedicated to change and revolution and giving voice, voice to oppressed people. Calypso, Calypso music. Um, claiming our identity and reshaping, changing the identity they have given us of ourselves as a subordinate people, a, a suppressed people, and looking at ourselves as a free and beautiful people, the original people that can give so much to the world. The art was doing that. We produced the Folk Research Center as an institution okay, that stimulated art and culture, made us look at our language, you know, and the tremendous riches we have in terms of creating and how much we can give to the world as a Creole people. The world cuts. And I remember Stanley Friend writing a, French writing a play at that time, The Rape of Fair Helen. The Rape of Fair Helen. Talk about revolution. Fair Helen was St. Lucia. And we're going right back to, to the 60s, 70s. In the 70s and the 80s, had revolution all the time. Jalim, your father, your father was there, and your father became almost classical with the 
sculpture that he did. This was his classical St. Lucia. But he didn't take it before there was revolution. Even in there, a little organization just emerged, almost rebelling from your father and his sculpture, the organization called the Camp, with Kenneth Lawrence. Some of you are the old ones who remember Kenneth Lawrence. And, so. and they came almost like a revolution. That was your father and so on. In the sculpting, in the sculptor business and so on. A militant appearance from Kenneth Lawrence and, and the camp. And of course, we do our reggae music, Polish Mute, Montimi, Jomo is here. <laughs> right there, straight from that. Jomo, in the 80s, in the 80s, nobody was teaching us. Our schools was not doing art, nothing and so on. But art was happening, revolution was happening. People found the strength. Because art will always happen. And you had organizations, where, let me signal something like the Petit St. Lucie. Some of you would remember a tremendous organization of people, untrained artists. They trained themselves and exposed themselves, connected themselves to the world. But Petit St. Lucie did so much artistic work, looking at St. Lucia and examining development in St. Lucia, um, doing social art, doing revolutionary art. And, in dance and theater, etc., even challenge the world, um, even challenge the, the, the church uh, coming and joining. If you like Robert Lee, some of you would remember a production called Moments, um, a, a revolutionary production. Okay, with Carlton Schimmel as Judas, I remember that. Uh, okay, and then popular theater throughout the 70s, from the late 70s going into the 80s. We knew of traditional theater on stage, Lordy Daw, Proscenium Arch, and so on. And there were St. Lucians coming right through and doing theater, spreading theater all over St. Lucia, with groups like about 15 groups or so, all over St. Lucia doing theater, but doing a new kind of theater that found its vocabulary from our culture literally researched our culture, took out forms, and began doing a new kind of theater and giving, empowering lots of people, not only what we call artists, but people, a group of farmers, elder farmers in Forceja, using theater to explain their interest in deforest, this deforestation thing and so on, and using it as part of the solution. Always happening. And then the Creole language, the explosion of the Creole language led by the uh, the work of the Folk Research Center and Mouvement Creole, and what happened out of that. That Creole movement had what they call cells in many communities, okay, producing, producing language art, stimulating writing of poetry, stimulating right, even the writing, the bringing together of a Creole writing system or orthography, or from which artists, lyrical artists, can use to create art always happening. The revolution is always there. In the 90s, we saw the power of Soka, Revolution Calypso. Oh, coming from the late 70s to, I must mention, Calypso and the development of something like the takeover tent. Literal revolution by itself. These Rastafarians emerging onto things and all Calypso just ponging down African liberation and black liberation and so. Revolution time. Okay, and then we come now into the soca. We see the then we segment fellows coming and with new things, etc. And in the 90s, right now, into the technology, we see revolutionaries like Ted emerging in the digital media, film, um, digital media. The DJ is now becoming artist, replacing band. DJ, a big sh artistic show is a DJ on stage, mixing, etc., and the samplers, etc. So. The revolution is always there. Our issue has been, our issue has been how much we have been an obstacle to that revolution. How much our society, our community has not recognized the importance of that revolution to our development, our growing, and have spent years, decades, centuries trying to put them down, our artists, trying to hide them, trying to destroy them. We have jailed them. We have prevented them from touring here. We have treated them unfairly in terms of they are really entrepreneurs, investors, and so on. But artists have not been able to get um, loans in the banks and so on. Very unfair treatment in relation to other business, businesses and so on. Okay. So we have to, it, 
I, I was given a notice there that we've, my time is over, so let me just make two points as to what is needed. The revolution is always happening. The artists are there. But we need to invest and facilitate that it continues rather than become the obstacles and the enemies, which is what we have been, which is what the society has been, and we always find that the artist is in a struggle, the struggling artist. And secondly, we need to protect our roots because we are, we'll talk about sustainability of the art, sustainability of our development. The only the way we sustain ourselves is if we understand, sustain our roots. That's what roots us down. As arts, we grow roots, and the roots anchor us. The roots sustain us. And I'm sorry, I know you gave me a, a time thing, but I, I want to end with a huge statement. Let the artist speak. This is Kendall Hippolyte with a poem called Fashioners of Progress. And it's speaking for the artist. Here he refers to himself as a poet, but think of all the other revolutionaries as we read it. Because you did not heed the voices of imagination, neither the tongues of trees nor the voices of poets, earth will erupt in a conspiracy of and nature. Earthquake and landslide will snap and grind to rubble your ball high idols of concrete and metal. Fire will shrivel the prefabricated palaces, swelling like boils on our inflamed land. Wind will shatter the thin cocktail glass illusions of our progress into glittering dust, scattering over the ruins of casinos and the high rise cemeteries made low. High rise cemeteries made low. Some of you would see what's happening in the shock cemetery eh, with the CDCs. We are burying people in CDCs right now. Sea gnashing at our degraded shoreline will foam corrosive spume that will dissolve your headstones. They will return to sand. But the poet's words will last. You will hear them prophesying in the hurricane, their warnings in the night sea, whispering towards your chambers. It will be the poet's words coming at you in the thundering sermon of the landslide in the revenging wind swearing down through the valley, the crackling of the sun gone wild. And when the earth has had her say and retribution afterwards, in the green time of healing, there will be other words given to other poets. There will be precious stones with healing properties, mixed with dirt, folded in leaves, and used as poultices. They will protect the children who recite them. But these words now are for you, David Stones, found at the river of reflection and gathered in a poem, ready. Come, fashioners of progress, come. You hold the steel cuffs of the law, the silver coins of bribery, the gun. But when you see a poet writing poems, run. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy Boots. Samuel, someone who has been around in the art for so much time that he needs quite a bit of time to get his stuff done. Of course, we can take away from his presentation that art is always associated with change and art is a natural part of us. And with that, we take great pleasure in introducing our next panelist, one of the new revolutionaries Mr. Ted Sandiford. Good afternoon, everyone. Please allow me to adopt the protocol already established. I was here to speak about, I'm, I was called here to speak about digital media, but I cannot speak about digital media alone without tying in traditional art, because without traditional art, there would be no digital media.
Art has had a critical role in shaping the modern world. It works hand in hand with innovation, evolving our society and state of being as we evolve it. We are in the year 2020. We are surrounded by technology and technological advancements. We are playing on the numbers 2020 by saying this year we have 2020 vision. The reality is many of us are blind. Some people choose to embrace art and show every level of appreciation for the craft. Others choose to deny art as being part of their lives. In our St. Lucian society, it seems that the latter of these two mentalities dominate. To send light into darkness of men's heart, such is the duty of the artist. If we talk about sustainability, art must come to play one way or the other. Before we talk about the present and the future, we need to discuss the past. Across history, art has been used to push agendas and ideologies. Art has evolved with us. From cave paintings used to recount events, to hieroglyphics used to record data and information, to Mayan calendars, to medicine, to architecture and engineering, to cartography. Art has been a survival tool. Art conveys information as well as emotion. Art is the ultimate asset to make the unknown attractive. As we advance in, te in technology, art advances as well. Nothing changes if nothing changes. In today's modern society, we are constantly surrounded by art. We are exposed to art countless times on a daily basis. The moment we are awake, we turn off our alarm and check our phone. It was designed by an artist. We brush our teeth. The label on the toothpaste was designed by an artist. We eat cereal. The box was designed by an artist. We jump into our vehicle, which was first conceptualized by an artist. Let's look at your, your garment, the design on your garment. It was designed by an artist. Okay? That logo you see there, <laughs> it was designed by an artist. All right? <laughs> I could go on and on, but you, you catch my drift. Technology is always changing life. Human beings have the desire to communicate. They want to be heard. Means of communication have also evolved. And guess what? Art is moving right along with it. The heart of social media is art. Art is the bridge for effective communication. It is the link between many cultures and people. It's amazing how human beings adapt and find creative ways of expression and displaying art in the modern world. Recent studies have shown that children's hands are losing their dexterity. They cannot form clay and do things differently because they are constantly holding iPhones, tablets, okay, and using the mouse. They are, having, they are having a difficult time in holding the scissors to, pen, to manipulate objects. So these children, they are still directed towards art, but a different kind of art. Augmented reality, digital sculpting, photo manipulation, digital art, 3D animation, 2D animation, film the term you don't need to be able to draw to produce an art, a fantastic piece is coming to play in the modern era being an art teacher for 18 years at st mary's college i noticed an increase in the number of students choosing graphic design as an option for cxc in my first year of teaching 
In 2000, 10% of students opted to do graphic design. By 2018, 100% of SMC visual arts students chose the option of graphic design. Nobody chose traditional drawing. It is not a coincidence, coincidence that the digital media class at Sir Arthur Lewis Community College is filled and we already have people waiting in line for the next academic year. The interest is growing and will continue to grow in digital art. The question is, do we have the technological tools needed to push this art in St. Lucia? With proper funding and investment, I think we can. Okay? And just let me note, art is evolving and we are still keeping the tradition. For example, let me state, um, okay, so instead of using the traditional pencil, okay, we use the iPad, we draw. We are using the same principles adopted by Leonardo da Vinci to get the proportions of the face and so on, okay? And then, using a printer, we produce our piece on canvas. We are using the same principles. I'm stressing on that because I often have to defend digital art from traditional artists, with traditional artists because they said, they claim that art, digital art is cheating. But at the end of the day, the key word here is creativity. Using what the tools that you have. And sorry to sound harsh, but we have to be up to the time. All right. Why am I doing all this? Why am I stressing, stressing so much importance on the role art plays in society? In our small St. Lucian society, I find that we artists are constantly, we have to constantly remind people of the importance of art. Many St. Lucians still don't get it. I still find myself trying to convince parents to allow their child to do visual arts because they possess immense skill. We get resistance from people in all walks of life. For this country to move forward, there must be a shift in the attitudes of its people. Another obstacle faced in St. Lucia is that many young artists become, become confused about technology. They believe that all art should be new and fresh. Technology is only a tool. A young artist needs to grow inward and accept and ex expect, sorry, and accept his or herself. And then this will come outwards to gain acceptance from others. The avenue to help budding artists and find, to find them themselves is education. The education system needs to begin programs in the arts at an early age, not secondary school, from kindergarten. I won't deny the fact that art awareness is increasing in St. Lucia and the wider world. Art, always, art will always mean different things to different people. Today, however, it's anything you want art to be. There are artists who take bold steps and use the idea that art is all about expression. They leave it up to the public to decide if it's art or not. I will leave you by mimicking an art piece done, a controversial art piece done recently.
That's it. And the stabbing artists. These gentlemen also seem to be dabbling in the field of comedy as an art. <laughs> Fine. Just for the record, I want to let you know that I did give Mr. Sandy Ford his time cue digitally. So <laughs> We can certainly take away from that presentation that art is the link between culture and people. Interestingly, the question pops up, do the artists or the artists really understand what art is? And probably that's something we would need to, dis to discuss a little later on. But what was frightening, I don't know if I should be scared about it, was the idea of loss of motor skills by young people. Uh, up for discussion again. All right. To move things along, a dramatist at heart, if you do know her in person, goes by the name of Drinia Frederick, and we take great pleasure in welcoming her to the podium. Summer with the challenge. <laughs> um, when I first got this invitation, I asked Nicole, are you sure you want me here? Um, most times I'm a bit controversial and most artists will tell you they disagree with me because my image and my view of art and artistic expression is quite different. I don't believe in the philosophy of the struggling, starving artist walking on a beach writing poems. Art, artistic revolution. Art is supposed to imitate life, and sometimes life imitates art. Every movement in the world was pushed by an event, propelled by some sort of revolution and to coincide with the revolution an artistic expression was born or gave fruit to the revolution to aid it on its quest art in itself is a means of expression an expression that is supposed to strengthen an ideology a state of being and ultimately if we look and we go back in time, moving towards what I call modernization. Now I know you're all looking at me already, so here it goes. If we go back to the 14th century, we all know that there was a rebirth in knowledge, going back to the classics, and of course that gave birth to Columbus coming here, the exploitation of slavery, the whole scheme of things that has put us right here into the Caribbean. Along with that renaissance came that birth of theater that has evolved over that period of time. We no longer sit outside in a big amphitheater and shout and stand on platform heels and say, Thus came the sea! We have now moved into theaters with sound engineering, lighting, digital aids. We have now moved into a state where the art theater is now merging with film. Theater is now merging with other forms of entertainment. And I will draw reference to Calypso. As a child, when I went to Marshall to listen to Calypso, even before that, the town hall, there was no such thing as an elaborate presentation. If we look at the evolution of Calypso presentations, it started off, I believe, in Vader, started the revolution, came on stage and he did this song with this whole African presentation and people said, no, he won because of his presentation, that's not right, and he didn't deserve to win. The following year he came back, 
and he came on stage and he sang Just As I Am. Again, a form of presentation. Since then, Calypso presentations have changed into massive productions. Okay, the input of theater, short scenes on stage before the song starts, short scenes during the song, and now it has evolved to a state where you cannot go to a competition without seeing something on the big screen. You cannot enter a competition without having a short video compiled with theater. That is the revolution that has happened in terms of art in St. Lucia. If we go back and we look at the Arts Guild in their time, it was a revolution. It was revolutionary that people who were colonized were still able to produce art, still having a renaissance to go back into their culture and traditions and pull up images of that to put on stage. We see that with popular theater. Uh, of course, reference to Petit Setlisi. They developed a whole new system of dance based on our traditions. And of course, I would like to demonstrate. I mean, most of us know this classical move. <laughs> So we have developed our own revolution based on our own renaissance. Roots Theatre, that was a renaissance. Going around, um, that was used as a means of ad advocacy. Okay, I remember Planned Parenthood using popular theatre, spreading ideas, that radical sense. However, since then, has the revolution died? How has this revolution transmitted itself towards modernization and towards our current society? What is the message that we are carrying? Two things has happened. There is a revolution. There's a digital revolution, and there's a revolution of what I call aesthetics. We no longer want to go to events where it is bare. We want to see smoke and mirrors. When we go to see a production, we rate it as good if it has lots of fog. And I guess I am guilty of that part of the revolution. It must have the bangs of lighting. It must look like something that we have seen when we have gone to see a Broadway production. And we expect to replica what we have seen in the first world in our 238 square miles of limited resources. And we expect that. We expect that when performers come on stage, that it is of the same quality as that world standard. However, have we created a revolution in terms of creating, one, an environment for that revolution to foster? What we see in the first world to create those standards here in terms of understanding the art as a business. And I go back to say that there's a new renaissance of understanding the business of art. I think I've been around long enough to tell you that I've seen artistic expression, theater, sculpting move from, that's a hobby, so now people are understanding that you need to pay for it. So then now, do we continue, or is the revolution lost, or we develop a new revolution where we now create systems where we can monetize this art, our artistic expression that benefits us as a society and as individuals? I know what I'm saying, you're raising your eyebrows, but that's okay. How we have found a way somewhat, maybe they're onto something. We have created St. Lucia as a festival destination where we have made an attempt to monetize it through tourism. How is that going to work? All of these advances, St. Lucia has about 10 or 12 festivals. How does that translate to the artists and how does that translate in terms of gaining a living out of it? Is it profitable? Are we still at a point where, and this is a fact, where St. Lucia has not developed a system to 
identify what is the contribution of cultural and artistic expression to the GDP. And this is a fact. Is it that we have a new revolution of trying to discover what that is? The revolution of the artist learning how to understand the world system of entertainment. And when I say that, learning the business of the art, learning how do I fit into that. We often speak about um, the internet and YouTube and I can post my videos and my songs. How do you monetize that? How do you gain from that? Where do you fit into the scheme of things? How do you create a product that the world now comes to you where you are on your own terms and you can dictate and negotiate the, 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 the terms of the deal. We always create a situation where we're always looking abroad. We're always looking to them to hand them something and say, yes, I have created this demo. Can you please sign me on to your label? Can you please sign me on to your film company? Can you please sign me on? You have no power. So is it now the point where we have to start a new revolution, where we empower ourselves as artists, as solutions, in understanding the system and the business of arts, creating policy, creating a means where we educate persons about art forms, about ourselves, where it came from, how we started, the point in which we're going and where we're going, and how we can monetize this in terms of our benefit as a country, in terms of our benefit, in terms of what we are now trying to figure out as our cultural and creative industries. And I will stop here because you are looking at me. I'm available for questions. Thank you. But very perceptive indeed, Ms. Frederick, Drenia Frederick. Of course, the big takeaway here is that art is business. And the big question or the big concern is that it is business that needs to be harnessed and monetized. Thank you very much for those provocative thoughts. And so we turn to our final panelist, Mr. Jalim Yudovic. Welcome him. It's very important to start with um, thanking Ted for the free meal. <laughs> and um, I also have an axe to grind with whoever organized or arranged the, sitting, the, the, speaking, the, the speaking order because it's absolutely wicked to have me the, been the last after all these very profound speakers, you know. <laughs> Revolution, what is it? I mean, it's a huge, huge word. It's, it's, a, it's a big word which operates... Um, on multiple levels. There's personal revolution, and there's a revolution that um, you know, connotes um, politics and revolution in the grandest sense of the word. I believe that before we could delve into this um, topic, we first have to understand what is revolution. We have to define revolution to ourselves as a, as a people. What is a revolution? Who is it for? Why is the revolution? And I believe that um, when we understand or we figure out these um, questions, we will be able to ascertain whether or not we, are, we have we've had revolutions and whether we are in a revolution right now. And revolution is a word that is often um, confused with evolution, um, which is something that naturally happens to the, to the human being, something that normally happens to, to the spirit. And... Um, often it confused with proliferation as well. Um, because um, you could be prolific, you could see artists all of a sudden um, engaging in a certain activity, painting walls all over the place, and so on. But is that really a revolution? Is that challenging the norms of society, the, the of status quo, the politics? Is it causing people to think? Meanwhile, the outside world is looking at us and seeing us as being derivative, um, chasing our tails in a, in, a, in a circle and not elevating to the, a certain international conversation and not becoming part of a much broader movement that, that is going on in the world right now. 
which is one of self-actualization and self-identity. I just came from Miami, um, where there's a huge movement um, that is sort of attached with the black lives, where it came, off, came out of that kind of philosophy of, of, the, of the black person being marginalized in a, in a society. And there is an act as a fundamental tool um, to sort of challenge these um, prejudices and damning things that, that exist within the society. So, you know, I, I see that as a sort of a revolution. My definition for a revolution would be, um, an artistic revolution would be um, when artists coalesce or galvanize um, around a certain philosophical commonality that um, often brings forth change. That's my revolution. That's, that's my definition of a revolution. Case in point, um, when, I, when, I, when I presented the um, sculpture at the runabout, that was a personal revolution for me. And I had every intention of upsetting society. I had every intention of creating debate of causing a ripple in the water. I mean, I didn't want my work to be ignored. I wanted it to be relevant um, in, shaping, in the shaping of you know, the thought processes of our people and how we self-determine, how we self-actualize, how we move forward. You know, because to me, art is not the answer. Art is simply a tool, a you know, mechanism, a key, if you will, um, that you know, gives us a certain a certain privilege to unlock much bigger questions, you know? Because we are all in life, we are all in this existence for one reason or the other. And I believe that um, our key purpose is to sort of find our certain path in, a, in existence. And we could do so as individuals or we could do so as a collective. But it's always better to do so as a collective. Um, Art as an aesthetic. I believe that um, art as an aesthetic is, um, is, is art that functions at a very low frequency level. You know, I mean, nothing wrong with that. You know, if you want to use art as an aesthetic, go ahead, do your thing. Um, because the, the art society, the, the, the art system is very multi-tiered. And you have to know what part you want to engage in. You know, but um, art as an aesthetic, um, to me, is not revolutionary. Um, art as, as having a greater agenda, uh, like the way um, China uses art right now, um, they, is not aesthetically. They use it um, to develop the society, to develop the psyches of the people. You know, so um, I have participated in, in many public um, art commissions in, in China, seven to date, um, in various cities in um, China. And when I get my, you know, I'm your directive, is, is never about aesthetics. It's always about the much broader picture. China is moving towards this, this I mean, direction, and, you know, and they want the people's minds to be elevated or, or to be in um, a sort of synchronicity with that broader vision. So, you know, so, so we see art as a fundamental tool in um, governizing society and, and, and getting to a certain end. Um, have we had a revolution in St. Lucia? I believe yes. Um, you know, listening to, to Boots, um, who was actually there during the, um, the uh, period, Boots, what, what was it called when um, St. Omar and Derek Walker and all them came together and did that thing? It was as good. I believe that was definitely a revolution uh, because, um, you know, the um, stereotypical image of who we were and um, was defined by Europeans. It was, it was a very colonial um, you know, image. It was a very colonial way that we were looked um, at. You know? um, and these guys absolutely turned everything upside down. Um, you have said we're painting um, murals of black Jesuses everywhere, all, all, all over the island. That was a revolution. You know, I, I mean, you had Derek Walcott um, saying poetry about the um, fishermen, the um, fishers of the, uh, of the various villages. That was a, was, a, was a revolution. And I remember Derek said um, in one of his interviews that the, the penalty of colonialism was that 
the mango tree was never as good as the oak tree. Because Shakespeare wrote about the oak tree, and there was no one writing about the mango tree. And you know, and to me, that was a very profound statement. And what he endeavored to do was to give the, the mango tree the same dignity as the oak tree. Right? And right now, we can stand and eat a mango and think of one of Derek Walker's poems. You feel like you're eating poetry. And essentially, that was what um, France and, and every, every elevated or civilization that has reached, that, that, that have gotten to the apex in the world have embraced the philosophy of art as a developmental, transformative thing. When you drink a bottle of water from France, it's just ordinary water you will drink, you know. It's not better than our Paradise Springs water. But when you imbibe this water, you are imbibing the entire marketing campaign of, of very creative people that make you feel like you're you under the Eiffel Tower and there's violins playing while you're drinking that, that water. So there's an economical aspect to it as well. And any society that puts artists and creative people at the forefront, I dare say, um, all your problems are, are, are solved instantly. I believe art is the, is the panacea. It's what unlocks the imagination, right? And what we're facing right now is a creative crisis, is, is a crisis of the critical mind. We are not a critically thinking people in our, in our whole, right? Every single problem that we have, you, you talk about littering, is a problem of the critical mind or lack thereof, of critical thought. You know, because when you think you could just throw a, a bag of trash over, um, um, over the bush and the problem is solved, that, that means you're not thinking critically. You're not thinking of that trash going into the river and, and, and the river leading into the ocean, right? You know? And, I mean, the way we build, are we, are we building in concert with the landscape? Are we, are we building in concert with the environment? You know, I mean, I've been to um, 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 villages where people put the um, balconies away from the ocean and the sunset, you know, that is not a critical thought. You know, when you are inclined to take the life of your, of your brother or your, or, or your sister for something as trivial as them owing you a few bucks, you are not figuring critically and you are, you, are, you are not aligned with the transcendent thoughts or spirituality of the universe that art gives you inherently. And um, my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could be a, a palapata and go on forever. So um, I'd like to end with saying that, um, you know, it is time that um, we have a government of artists. And, you know, I believe that is our, our, our salvation, you know? And that's the revelation that we need. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mr. Jalim. And art that merely serves the purpose of superficial aesthetics, he says, is not revolutionary. That is profound. Of course, art is revolutionary when it is designed to disturb the mind. And I use the word disturb there thinking, reflecting on the words of the writing of Jean Piaget, who says that learning only takes place in the environment of disequilibrium. So when there's disequilibrium, there's learning taking place. Thank you so very much, Mr. Jalim. And we are at this point, uh, according to my uh, timepiece, we are about 10 minutes to the hour of 2 o'clock. And I expect that the audience would want to ask a few questions and we would allow for that for the next 10 minutes and perhaps I can start uh, things rolling by asking of the panelists and anyone can answer. It's a, it's a burning question and something that we cannot leave the room without getting a handle on. It was mentioned earlier that sometimes you go to a museum or you see great work of art that looks as if you can get some paint, take a brush and just splash it on that canvas, 
And someone will look at it and say, hey, um, that's worth a million. And you think that you can do it. What's the, what's the big deal? Many of us are not really aware of what art is. I would not like us to leave the room without hearing from the panelists some kind of definition, some kind of idea as to what really is art. What is art? The microphone seems to be passing. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I need to stress that art is communication. Okay, the artist is trying to send a message out. Now, the person who takes to that message, as in, I'm talking about the abstract art, you're talking about the, the, the splashes of paint and whatnot, okay, that person will pass and they will look at it and they will have this connection to it. They, based on the way the colors are and whatnot, they, they will gravitate towards that. That's why I have observed that realistic art, as in realism, is on the decline. Realism, it doesn't sell. Ab an abstract piece will sell quicker, and it's more conversational. I can see somebody, in fact, I, I've seen people stand in front of an abstract piece and just have a conversation for hours about what they think it is. Take, for example, you go by the roundabout, you have four fellas on, a, on, the, on the rows and so on, and there's no boat. Gassa, who's the madman that do that? But Gassa, you ain't no... Gassa, check that. The boat can be there, you know. It, it, it's invisible, but the fellas moving towards the... You see, they will, they will stand there for hours, and at the end of the day, okay, they will have an appreciation for the art. Okay, so I would say it's a connection. The artist is, com making, is communicating to his or her audience. So art okay? is essentially subjective. It is subjective. It is subjective. And I would say that we, have, we fall victims to that because I still cannot understand how they mark CXC art. Because I've had some of my top students go in and do that and they fail by doing top pieces and some of my weak students, they pass. Because art is indeed subjective. All right? And because that I know that, I often tell my students, don't do anything political, don't do anything <laughs> religious. And, yeah. it is, Mr. Samuel. Yeah, it is subjective, eh? but no, subjective to the artist too. Eh? Right. Um, a good piece of art. So beauty is in the eye of As the world. As he says, it's communication. A good piece of art, we create it. Not just the, art, not just the artists. We create, we create meaning. We create thing, our engagement with it. Or, and your engagement of everybody here with a, a good piece of art will be all different. They may all come out with a different opinion of it, a different whatever, but that's what makes it good. And as I said, I did give a kind of a definition of art. It's the creative, the creative imagination being put in a form where it is um, communicative um, within, this, within this physical world. Just one little <laughs> side thing with the guys in a boat where there's no boat. <laughs> I did I was fortunate to be around some fellas really trying to make out what that there and what kind of puppy shoes that just they put on us <laughs> and things like that. But I know all kinds of interpretation, but the one that really got me was a straight political one. But see that for us. You see that the fellas that are in the boat there, that is Alan Chastney. <laughs> Guy Joseph, um, uh, um, Dominic Fede, and then they give the mayor, Peter St. Francis, a ride. <laughs> I told you there's a thing for comedy among the panelists. <laughs> but in the, interest of, in the interest of time, and in kind of nailing down the, the topic, if art is subjective... How can it be revolutionary? And, and, if, and if it is revolutionary and subjective at the same time, would not that be a breeding ground for chaos as opposed to unity? 
Um, well, speaking from the perspective of what performance and theatre is supposed to do, it is supposed to create that sort of cathartic moment in the audience when you come face to face with a situation or an experience that causes a change in your life. Whether you leave the theater, whether the production was about spousal abuse and you've now come face to face with your own abuse and you leave the theater with this conviction that I have to create a change. Or you leave with the experience that this is the reality for some people and I am not alone. And there's a parallel world beyond mine and this is an experience of somebody else. This is somebody else's story. And essentially, it's a telling of stories. As to whether that is subjective, yes it is. As to whether it is chaos, yes it is. And of course, chaos breeds creativity. And it is that chaos that allows us to be individuals. It allows us to create ourselves in terms of St. Lucia itself is an amalgamation of very interesting people. This place seems chaotic, but yet still there's a function. Um, it is said that St. Lucia has the most talented people, creative people, and of course, if I can quote you, there, what is the outlet for that creativity? Of course, some people may say that creativity might turn to violence. Maybe that explains all of the aggression. But the revolution that has occurred is that creativity has evolved. And whether or not you like the Denry segment, it is that creativity of living in a village, living wherever in St. Lucia. I don't have a job. I don't have this. I don't have that. But I could bust a tune and sing about my reality and sing about the things that mean something to me. And it is that that has created that revolution, whether it is still at the level of a subculture or whether it has broken through mainstream that propels the society to the point where we are even talking about it, whether we are talking about that at the roundabout, because I can tell you I was part of the unveiling of the sculpture at the roundabout. Um, and for me, standing there at that moment when it was unveiled, the general public had an ah moment. I don't know if it was shock or they were surprised, but it generated this whole conversation. Whether we want to take it on a political train, whether we want to take it on an individual train, in terms of getting us to the point to understand ourselves as a society and where we're going. And you know what? After that sculpture, in the next, I predict, 10, 5 years, there will be more. And then there'll be less talk and less chatter. This is what it's supposed to do, that cathartic moment. Whether you want to take it in a positive sense or a negative sense. Sense, so that is what it does. In essence, according to socialist theory, conflict does bring change. It is what we do with that revolution that comes out of it. I think it's only fair that we give a few opportunities to the audience to ask some questions, and we can take one. Thank you, panelists. I think the question of what is art is a very, uh, very serious question, and I'm seldom satisfied with the answer. I find it's um, subjective, yes, but the whole issue of what it is, I've come up with my own definition, which I'd like to share. I think art is created any time a human being intervenes in his or her environment and does a rearrangement, quote-unquote. In other words, I can take my cell phone and rest it here and claim this to be art, and I'm the artist. And you see that happening a lot now in the, what the you call banana. it? Yeah, yeah. Yes, with the banana. <laughs> and so, we can extend the idea to traditional methods. Like, I can take paint, put it on a canvas. I've made a rearrangement. I've taken it from here and I've put it there. 
carbon from a pencil, I've drawn. There must be human intervention. Anything a human, a human being does to cause some kind of rearrangement of objects, anything within the environment, I think it's art. So I cannot claim that the, <clears throat> the, the lovely clouds at sunset is art. I can't claim that as an artist. I did not intervene to create that. And I think broadly, if you take it on that level, it defines art. Any arranged thing, anything you do to cause a change, it can be in a, a recording, you sing some song, there's a, on a stage you dance, and you, you do something different, this is, this is art. Now I know that definition artists do not like because at the end of the day, it makes everybody an artist. <laughs> but everyone is an artist. There are different levels. Okay? I think that there is a level of it where aesthetic sensibility matters. Ms. Frederick, you mentioned the business aspect. Creating for a purpose to sell. If it doesn't meet the aesthetic sensibilities of your market, you ain't gonna sell anything. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Again, uh, we are, with that definition, making it even more fragmented and more subjective in terms of what art is. And I think a revolution has to do with some coming together around an ideal so that a certain cause can be forwarded. I am not quite certain what the panelists would have to share on that. There's a question. Yeah. We have a lot of difficulty trying to determine what art is. Perhaps the panelists could just shed a little light on what it is not what it is not. I'm saying this simply because the case of the banana and what Mr. Fevery just proffered a while ago. And it's a, I believe where we have some difficulty is when we start to put a price on it. We may start to really what the problem is not whether it's at but whether we agree or accept the monetary value that has been placed on it. So I would like to hear from the panelists what it is not. What is art not? Okay. Um, in my personal view, what has convoluted the, the, um, the, art, the, the perception of art now is primarily the, the, the market that art you know, exists in. Art, art now is a, is a Investment commodity is a is a it has become a commodity that is um, you know manipulated by certain powers that be you know like for example that um, banana thing right someone bought it for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars was it you know and I'm sure that they're going to resell it for three hundred thousand dollars <laughs> it would have rotten but the uh, but the artist. Uh, but, the, uh, but the artist is going to just put another one there and say that was part of his um, philosophy all along, like it had to deteriorate, right? So, to me, and I, I, I also appreciate that of art, you know, you know, because there's a thought process there. So I am not one to like bash or to uh, criticize um, an, an artist's creative process or the product that comes from an artist, because um, you know, because other people will. Um, have a different views, and they will say that's different the arts, and it's pushing the envelope. It is revolutionary, etc. I think what is not you know, art is not um, insincere. You know, I think when when art is not done out of love or a certain level of honesty or spirituality, then to me it is um, not art. Um, but to go back to the question, what is art? I no, what, what art? What is not? Well, yeah, yes, yes. You know, but I also wanted to stab at you know what it is. You know, okay. because I believe that's that's also important. Um, I believe that art is a certain reconciliation with the um, ineffable, um, a very personal ineffable. Because all of us have things that we like to interpret, and we and we also 
and we all do so differently in, in we find different ways to to bring life and shape and manifestation to certain things that we have in our minds and in our you know in our um, creation and I believe that's what art is you know um, Mr. Chair, I, I don't have an answer and I'll try to answer I will question why is it so necessary for us to come down to some conclusive definition of what art is it's a very dangerous thing to do because we will be surprised Art, by its nature, as I said, is revolutionary, mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. And we will go and put a box around this and say, this is art, this is, and tomorrow somebody will come up with something that will astound you, as con contemporary art is doing now. As and I think we better think more in terms of the role, the communication that, that, that um, Ted tried to stress so much the, the kind of engagement that this particular thing that which we are trying to define because it will appear in all kinds of different forms that will continue to astound you and it is and that uh, that process of trying to put out definition of box and so on is actually entering the power games in the society by doing that you give some people power to be able to marginal, uh, marginalize or oppress some others and say this is not art or say do support that or say do, uh, 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 that's, and, that's and what I, th this I think that some people who may, be, who may be questioning uh, may be wondering yeah. uh, if we can define art, it possibly would help us to understand and support the artists who want us to support their art. But before and I give the microphone to her, I must say that we must be able to create standards for ourselves. And not because you come up with a song that says run, run, you put a beat to it that it is some profound art that would transform lives. It might be in a particular community. Why not? Why? That's you trying to... But it's those same standards that we have to try to create terms of creating a system for ourselves these same artists talks about the value of your work that you place on it you have to create some sort of standards a centoma is not the same as somebody who has just begun this is a master so are you saying that okay so mastery his work is worth that much the, the, <laughs> to, to the to the committee, let me, let me say one quick word to the committee, doctor, okay. it looks as though we need a part two of, <laughs> of the discourse and, um, <laughs> and we are quickly running out of time so we will um, just have a contribution on, just from to on just Sentia. what she was trying to say about standards. A lot of people hire an architect and they give us a preview of what they want, but yet still, when we produce those drawings, we take time, we put our creative efforts, the first thing they begin to say, no, 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 I need a small house with a big bedroom, a big kitchen, and a large living room, but they only have X amount of money to construct that building. So we must begin to have some level of standards within our artistic element for us to say no. This is what has to happen for your amount of money or for your... <laughs> That's why we're getting mass production. Thank you.